as you probably know, uh, uh, former Secretary of Hood signed a, a document last year, I believe, uh, oh, uh, basically starting the idea of, of safety management systems across DOT agencies. Uh, we've been exploring it one way or another in FAA now for about 10 or 12 years, starting with our air traffic organization. Uh, however, I don't want to get, a, get the idea that I'm here because we're ahead of anybody or whatever have you. I tell a lot of people I don't think I've ever had an original thought in my life. Uh, but I was taught in graduate school at one time that if you take somebody's stuff and sell it, it's called plagiarism. If you take a bunch of people's stuff and write their names down and sell it, it's called research. So I don't believe in plagiarism, but we research absolutely shamelessly. So what you're going to see, anything I can provide, is really a compendium of a lot of people's work across the world. And so we, we really appreciate the, the opportunity to, to share and to learn with each other. Uh, I'm going to work the, the, the title slide probably harder than you're used to. Usually we click, click past them, but what are we talking about here? First thing, we, you probably had this build as safety management systems, right? Probably that's kind of going to talk about SMS uh, right here. You notice something missing in the title right there? There's no systems in there, isn't it? One of the things that we found first principle, and I'll probably reinforce this several times there, is we don't want to think of it as the SMS thing. It's very, very easy to do that. If you've probably seen over the last 20 or so years, like a lot of us, quality management systems, environmental management systems. Anytime they're thought of as a thing, though, then they start to lose their significance. Because the next thing you see, we're going to talk about culture up here. Now, some of you might say, oh, OK, good, safety culture. That's kind of important. Others of you, though, and typically our technical agencies, and I was one of them for many, 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 many years. I used to be an engineer until I found out there was therapy for that uh, oh, uh, myself. And t most of us are technical people, right? And we start talking about cultures. So, oh, I start rolling out. Here's the touchy-feely guy again. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And hopefully, when we get done, you're, you'll have a little bit more of a tangible idea, because I was got to this in terms of partly frustration in a way that safety culture tends to be that place where you can almost picture anytime the, the, the discussion starts, the arm waving start, you know, the culture. Well, no, I don't know because it turns out to be oftentimes that abstract dumping ground for anything that's too abstract for us to understand there. So I'm going to talk about that because it's very important, but it has to really be tangible and it has to be something that we can look for in our organizations. Risk management, we'll talk about that in a minute, central to, uh, to, uh, oh, uh, to uh, safety management and safety. Uh, again, it's what makes safety somewhat tangible. We'll talk about that a little bit as, as we, we go along. That one is also one that, that risks being buzzword status. Uh, you know, I, I often state that there are some words, and risk management is becoming one of them, data-driven and safety culture, that, that I could swear in some quarters I could take a blank sheet of paper, put these words randomly on the page, fill the rest in with nonsense syllables, and the document would sell because the right words are there. We're going to try to look about the significance of risk management to safety management. And finally, SMS, because we are going to talk about SMS, but hopefully by the time we get there, a little bit more nuanced idea of what we're really trying to put in place and what the objectives are on a safety management system. Now, mostly we're going to be talking about the things that would be the expectations of the service providers that we as regulators oversee uh, uh, there. But hopefully we can also see the things that affect the culture and practices within our own organizations as, as regulators. But that's the first thing that I want to, 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 to reinforce here then, going back to the top and the title, is that safety management is something that you do and not something that you have. So it's very easy as for us as regulators to achieve kind of a checklist mentality. Oh, have they got the SMS thing out there? Well, it's got this, it's got that, it's got that, it's got that. Yep, safety management system's okay. And then we find out after the explosion or the wreck or the accident or whatever have you, then we start talking about safety culture because we find the, beha the organizational behavior behavior really didn't support those sorts of things that we expected to see in the SMS thing. So we'll kind of sort that out a little bit. This also is, is a, a case that, uh, that I didn't used to make a whole lot out of this, was my divider slide. Uh, this, you probably can't see this little weak laser here, but this is the accident rate since the 1930s when we first started regulating aviation. I think in just about any industry, some cases I was talking to the rail industry, they're 
curve looks a lot alike, but it's maybe almost a century earlier when we started started uh, working with rail. Your industry, the industry that you oversee, is going to look different, but I'm going to say it looks a lot the same. Lots of accidents until we started getting a handle on the technology and the engineering, and then a precipitous decline. And in most mature industries in the modern world, you're going to see something like that. You're going to see we've got most of the low-hanging fruit picked. We've got most of the real engineering causes at least understood out there, and we're relatively stable accident rates. Most of our industries are actually pretty safe, particularly in the transportation industries there. But what this says is oftentimes you're going to hear, oh, well, you've been doing this all along. You've really got all of these things already in your, your companies. It's what I call the palliative approach. You know, we're trying to not scare people and make people feel comfortable with this new initiative. I'm here to tell you, though, anytime you see a curve like this that says we're stable, something's got to change if you're going to change that. And in saying you're doing all of this and you're not going to do anything new and you've really got this under a di different name, what we're really saying is that curve is okay. We're okay with where things are right now. So we really have to do some things. What we do want to convince people, we want to scare our people, that yes, you have the skills, you have the capability, but you are going to have to think differently about safety. Your culture, the way your people automatically behave, is going to need to have some things changed in the way they perceive safety. So. That's where we have. So what is this safety thing? We really think about that. I, I challenge our groups all the time. I don't know how your rule structure is, but I challenge our groups all the time. We've been working with aviation safety as a regulated industry for 85 years now or so. We started, I think it was in 1928, with the Department of Commerce originally uh, doing that. And I ask our groups, where is safety defined in our regulations? Now, I don't know how it is in the regulations that, that your group works. And, where is it? Is it in part one that has all the definitions? No. Is it in part 121 that governs the major airlines? Is it in part, part, part? It isn't anywhere. We've never actually defined safety. We use it all the time. It's all over. So it bears maybe a simple discussion. Well, safety, let's start with the dictionary. We're going to define a term. Okay. Freedom from harm. Can we do that? Now, oftentimes I'm told, well, we can do that if we don't participate in whatever hazardous activity we have. So if we don't fly, and you'll excuse me if I use aviation examples, that's our background, but I think you can allude to this. Okay, if we don't fly, we can have freedom from harm due to aviation. A simple example here, about 40 years ago, I was living in the state of California, and we had an old, tired freighter, twin-engine freighter, lost one engine, couldn't maintain altitude, kind of drifted down, wrecked the airplane in a farmer's field. Didn't really hurt anybody, messed up the airplane, tore up some field there. Middle of the night. The investigators couldn't understand why the farmer was so anxious to get the investigators and the, the rescue people in and out of his farm, was very reluctant to let them on, until the sun came up, found out that he had crashed the airplane in the largest marijuana field that they had seen in the state of California. So if you ask that farmer if he was able to be harmed by aviation while not participating in it, we can't really achieve that objective completely there. In your business, I believe, in, in pipeline hazardous materials, that's especially acute, I believe. People who are not direct participants or even recipients of the services certainly can be harmed by that. So we're not going to really achieve that even by non-participation. Let's talk about this. The senior lawyers of the world, the Supreme Court said in 1980, and this was an industrial case there, Safety is not equivalent to risk-free. Ah, so we can have risk. We're starting to introduce that R word in here. So it says, yeah, we can certainly have some risk, which says risk is what? Severity and likelihood of something bad happening to us. So we can have some risk and still consider ourselves safe. Go back a little further. Uh, again, aviation, Jerry Letter was director of safety of NASA for a number of years. He was a pretty good risk manager himself. He was still going to conferences at age 100. Uh, there passed away 102, 103 or something like that. But we think risk management's a buzzword, as I mentioned. 1928, he was talking about it back then. So it's not a real new thing. Let's go back even a little bit further. Now we talk about ex deliberately accepted risk. Don't treat this as what we talk about as deliberately in, an a in, in a violation, something like this. Deliberate, think of that. When, when, when Wilbur was talking about this, he's thinking you have to think about risk. You have to understand the risk and accept the fact that you can control it adequately. Fundamental principle of risk management. And in aviation, it was right back at the birth of aviation. In fact, two years before, we successfully fly, flew a powered airplane. Now, the people up in, in, in Montreal uh, have done us a favor uh, in defined safety. Uh, if we can read through all these words, a whole bunch of words. This is really too complicated. This violates all of the principles of slidesmanship. But let's look at this. 
So you'll see the same things we talk about, risk of harm. So yes, there is risk of harm, understanding, deliberating about it, reducing it to an acceptable level. Hold that thought, acceptance of risk that is understood as a fundamental principle and one that we have to understand as we regulate and as we make regulations as regulators. We are the people who accept risk for the public. We're the, we're the, the, the social risk takers, if you, if, if you will, or agents of the, of the, of the traveling public or the, or the service provider or, or, or good, uh, good uh, recipients there. And, and then our service providers have to understand this as well. So anyway, that boils it down a little bit. What we say is when operational definition, that is what are we going to look for in terms of practices that are safety, it's how well risk is managed. Okay, So it took a little bit of time to get there, but I think that's important. If we're going to talk about a safety management system, that's got to translate things into, tra into tangible things that we can see happen out there. And it's talking about risk management, basically. Management priorities here, I just put this one in the other day after actually discussing this with the Federal Railway Administration there. The three things, you'll often see the balance, I think James Reason had this in a couple of his books if you've, if you've uh, read them uh, over there, a professor over in University of Manchester talks about production and, pr and protection and whatnot. I like to look at it in, in, the, th in the threesome though. How many times do you see something hanging on the wall that says safety is job one, safety is our highest priority? You're going to see that probably on every wall and every company, and, and they may have just put it up because you're coming uh, oh, uh, out, out there. We probably see it around in our own organizations because you say, well, safety. Safety is what we're, we're all about there. But you think about that. Is that really why organizations exist? Do organizations exist to be safe? Did you come to work today to be safe? You know, I could start getting a, a show of hands, don't need to, because it'd be 100% when I'm done, how many people drove to work, rode the metro to work, rode a bus to work, biked to work, and other than the people that slept here last night, everybody came to work somehow. So are you safer here than you are at home? So did you come to work to be safe? If you're safer here, you might question your neighborhood, but uh, safety isn't necessarily job one. Why do we build pipelines? Not to be safe. Why do we run buses and trains and airplanes? It's to provide some sort of service, right? One of the things that Department of Transportation requires of an air carrier before we determine that they can fly safely is public convenience and necessity. They're able to provide a usable service. And then sometimes we as regulators tend to look bad. Oh, they're just interested in making money. Well, of course they're interested in making money. They have to make money, partly for substance, but also there are other regulators out there. There are investors that invested money in these companies and nobody wants their retirement fund invested in a company that has no interest in, in getting a return on investment. So they have to do that. And of course they all interact right out, right out here that, that we have to make money for sustenance. We have to make, we, we have to sustain, uh, sustain ourselves out there. We're not all Mother Teresa. We can't do good things and not receive compensation for it. But also we have to provide something. If you're in a conversation where, you, where there's an expectation of you giving someone money without providing something useful to, for it, you're probably talking to your kids. Uh, so they, 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 they interact right there. And, and of course, you can't provide a, a service and you can't make money if you're dead. The dumbest CEO in the industry knows it's bad business to kill your customers, you know, unless you're running the mafia or something like that. So it's a triumvirate. Real businesses have to balance. It's not a question of being safe. It's a question of providing useful services to the public safely out there. I think it's an important balance that a decision makers have to make because that's Principle number one, we said it's something you do. So it's not the domain of the safety department. It's the domain of the people that have to be providing the service. They have to understand safety. They have to enforce the items that are done. We'll talk about this a little bit more in, in safety culture right here. But safety management has to be done by the folks that are in charge of the productive service. It's not an ancillary uh, task. So culture, again, we'll talk a little bit about culture. Hopefully we'll have a little more tangible idea than you may or may not have when, when, we're, when we're, we're done here. I've, I've, I've heard folks say, well, we have to establish a safety culture. We have to have a safety culture uh, there. And I've even been asked, what do we do? We have to get a safety culture first or an SMS first? Hopefully we'll be able to answer that question uh, when, we, when we're done here. So bear with me a little bit here. Uh, human performance, this is a kind of a long slide. I really need to, uh, to re-engineer this a little bit. But first thing, 
you know, don't look too closely at exactly all the, all the text there unless you want to. By the way, I'll provide copies of any of this presentation material that, that folks want to. I even do that to the industry. I tell them it was made on government time, so if you paid your taxes, you already paid for it. Uh, you know, we're sister organizations here in, in Department of Transportation, so again, I like to, like to share where, uh, both, both ways there. But of course, most accidents do occur due to human error. It's very easy for us to, to look very, as practitioners, I used to be a technician, a pilot, an engineer, uh, oh, uh, a number of things that I found out that I was improficient uh, at here. But when you're a practitioner, you come from a practitioner background, it's unmistakable what's going to happen the first time you hear something happen. Who did what? What dummy did that? You know, I, and it's all could have done, should have done, I'd have done different, that sort of thing. But in most cases, human error really is, is ubiquitous. And one of our friends up at ICAO said, hey, you see these things, it's 60% or 70% or 80% of accidents are due to human error. But the rest of them are what? Well, somebody maintained the system. Somebody designed the system. He says, why don't you just call it 100%? Humans were involved in, in, in everything we do. And remember that organizations are nothing but groups of humans. So when we talk about management, we do have to have a much more nuanced idea of, uh, of, uh, of human error, because that's really what we're trying to reduce the risk of, build systems that induce safe behavior. So. Enough there. Let's talk about attitudes a little bit, because attitudes underlie culture. Let's talk about some things that, we, again, we talk about the human element and attitudes, and, and attitudes writ large are really just cultures. And the individual part of cultures are individual attitudes. There's variance there. So everybody good with that? Let's talk about this. Do you think this is a desirable trait for an employee or a leader? You know, someone who thinks critically about things. I'd say that's probably a desirable trait, right? Okay, do we say decisiveness? We tend to value that people that are decisive. They make decisions. They're, they easily make decisions. We value that trait typically in most organizations, right? I think, I think we could probably get most of the heads moving north and south on that, right? Okay, confidence. You know, how many times we say, well, that employee's not quite ready for the promotion because they don't really have the confidence yet. They need a little more seasoning, right? But that person's highly confident in what they do. They're, they're, they're decisive and they're confident and they think critically. So we're starting to talk about a person who's competent, right? So we tend to value these, these, these things. Well, we used to have these things and still use them uh, from time to time in, in aviation that we called the hazardous attitudes. Again, the way we tend to think of that employee who's made a mistake or whatever have you. So critical thinking, well, what about the person that just doesn't want to listen to anybody? We say, that person's anti-authority. What about the person who is so, they're impulsive, right? Isn't that the extreme of decisiveness? What about the person who's so confident that they say, nothing can hurt me because I'm so competent that I can, you know, I can fly this thing with, uh, with uh, you know, with all the systems broke or whatever have you, translate that into your own terms. So we say if too much is good, what about, what about the, the opposite extreme? Well, what about the person who doesn't question anything? What about the person who just says, oh, can't do anything about it, might as well just crash? Uh, oh, here. What about the person who's so, so fearful that nothing ever happens there? Or the person who is just so to the point where they don't understand. It's probably a better term for that, but that was the one used by the, the author that I researched this, uh, this from there. So what happens in a lot of cases, these attitudes are things that we build into our people. Because why the valued traits becoming, I'm not going to tell somebody I need help. We're going to talk about that in a little bit because people won't think I'm, I'm competent here. I'm not going to say again I'm, that, I, that I might need some help or that I don't really want to take on that task because people aren't going to think I have the confidence and, and so on and so forth. So we tend to sometimes breed these attitudes. Another one of the buzzwords that floats around is just culture. And it's a good one, but, it's a, it's a, it's a good, but it can go over the edge somewhat too because, well, we've got to establish a just culture. And we'll talk in a minute. I'm, we put a lot of markers up here that we're going to talk about in a few minutes here. We're going to have a big minute at the minute at the end here. But uh, here we, we say, well, we've got to establish a just culture. First thing I'm going to tell you, and we'll reinforce this later, that, that you can't establish, establish a culture by saying, hey, we've got to have a better culture here. We've got to have a safety culture, just culture, whatever have you. So, yeah, we'll write down a program plan uh, here, you know, and we'll hand it off to Alan and say, you know, we're going to come back and have a just culture. And in, in many cases, you're going to find many of the things that are in your culture, your culture here in your organization, your culture in the organizations you work with, you got most of the pieces there. 
I asked a group of, of aviators who were, were police officers uh, one time in a, in, a, in a briefing right here. I was giving them a safety management brief. It was really an interesting briefing, too. It was one of the first, only briefing I've ever given where about half of the attendees were armed. It really motivated you to do a good job. But I, I said, you know, do you believe that, mo that you and most of your colleagues are willing to work hard for desirable goals? And he said, yeah, I think most of my people are there. They're hardworking people. Okay. Do you think that most of your people are honest, have high integrity? You know, well, yeah, I think we do. I really think the guy to the left and the right and myself, I think we're honest or, you know, we're, 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 we're open uh, with, with, with each other. And, and do you think they're usually competent? Do you trust the other person in that helicopter with you, that other, other person that, that you're working uh, with, that, that they're competent? We say yes. Well, then why, after an accident, was that honest, hardworking, competent person suddenly, because the only thing that differentiated is they had an accident today, they're lazy, lying, incompetent people. We classify that person who's made the human error rather than looking at not what did he do or she do, but what happened to them. We talked about this with our controllers. If I said our controllers are sleeping on the job or they fell asleep, we say, why did he do that or she do that, right? But if we said, what happened to them? And we said, they collapsed on duty or they lost consciousness. Those were the, the words. We'd say, well, what happened? You know, this, did they have a heart attack? Did they have a, a seizure? Something like that. So again, the way we look at the attitudes that we have toward people and the attitudes that people reflect on the job become part of our, our culture here. And of course, management, we have to understand it in the context of our operations. We'll get to that when we get into the safety management system a little bit. And reducing errors is certainly, or reducing the, the conditions that, that uh, result in errors then uh, is one thing. But remember, human error is never an explanation. It's a description, and in most cases, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, somebody messed up. We, I, I, was, <laughs> I was working in my yard the other day, and somebody said, Did, were you involved with that accident? It was a week, what accident? You know? If some, I'm an FAA guy, doesn't know that, that somebody just wrecked a 777 uh, 100 miles to your, your north there. And, and people are starting to say, well, must have been pilot error. Well, duh. You know, of course mistakes are made in there, but it's got to go deeper than that. Why did two extremely experienced people have an accident in an airplane? What happened to them? We've got to look deeper. So human error is never an explanation. It's just a description there. If you start with human error, say mistakes are made. We know that now. And if we circle back and say human error at the end of the accident, we've re really arrived nowhere there. So anyway, let's talk a little bit more about culture. What kind of cultures do we, do we have? We have the ones that are the most salient that we tend to, we think about as culture, uh, the national or ethnic ones. We have professional and group cultures and subcultures. Even within a given organization and a given industry, engineers tend to think differently than economists, than lawyers, than, uh, oh, uh, than, than other folks in, in, the, in the organization. So you have professional cultures, different, different ways of thinking. You have organizational cultures, organizations uh, vary there. And then we have what we call safety culture. So what's, what's that? What's, what's a safety culture? Is there really such a thing as a safety culture? If so, what does it look like? I stood in the boardroom of a major airline about a, a year ago, made sure I, I was invited there, and then I was asked to talk when I got there. You know, got a whole room full of executives at one of the, the, the top ten airlines in the, in, the, in the country. So I made sure that I was in the exit row there, so I was closer to the door than, than anyone. And I said, you don't have a safety culture in this organization. You know, that woke them up a little bit. You don't have a safety culture. What you have is an XYZ Airlines culture. I won't tell you which one because it could be any, any of, of them. You have your airline culture. You have your company culture, your organizational culture, how you interact with your people, how you interact with your mission, your set of priorities is transcend safety is that handy label we put on the decisions you make about safety and your attitudes towards safety and your response towards safety. But there's no real separate thing called a safety culture there. That's the Don Art opinion, by the way. I always caution people you can get the agency position, the Don Art opinion, or the truth. I'll try to tell you when it's one of the first two, and you'll have to sort the other one out on your own, unfortunately. If I don't have a safety culture, though, how do I get it? And why do we care about culture anyway? Well, the reason I'll answer the last one uh, there, and we'll get a little bit further into it. The reason we care about it is that's what 
makes that predisposition to behavior, that set of automatic behaviors. Most people do things very, very automatically. That's the way our, our brain works. And that's basically the way we're able, why we're able to do a lot of the things we are. If you think about if I had to think that I have to move my left arm this way and my right arm that way and continue until the turn is done and I have to put my eye in, if you had to really think through every activity you had, you hadn't automatized that of that made it automatic there, you wouldn't be able to do a lot of the things you did. A lot of the things that we talk about is stereotypes and biases, by the way. I got in a discussion about this uh, the other day, are evolutionary. I have to be able to recognize that's a large animal over there, and I need to do something immediately. Sometimes overthinking means instead of being part of the evolutionary chain, I become part of the food chain, and that wasn't really good for us getting to where we were. So a lot of these things are negative because they're built, they're, 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 they're built into us, and, and the attitude towards safety is what we're trying to shape to where the automatic responses are, are what we want. So every organization has a safety culture. Again, it's not something that's saying, you know, you know Alan, I keep picking on you back there, I know, because you're sitting there by, the, by yourself and I can see you. But, you know, I said, you know, I uh, say, Mr. Maber, you know, we're going to have a safety culture around here. Write a program plan, set some milestones, you know, we'll have some audits and we'll have a safety culture around here. It doesn't really work like that. Does, does, doesn't, doesn't work like that. So when did we start talking about safety culture? Also, we're, we're okay on time, too? I've got to make sure we're, we're got to get you to the gate on time. I've, I've, it's, we're in the morning, not too bad. Usually, usually the times when you're right before lunch or right before happy hour, the pressure is on. Uh, right there. But at any rate, when did we start talking about safety culture? First thing in an at time in an accident report was that we saw it in a, in a, in a, a large scale accident was Chernobyl. And in, in Chernobyl, they said poor safety culture. Didn't have a clear idea what it was, but something was intangibly wrong here. First time we saw it in aviation was in an NTSB report. It was actually a dissenting opinion from Member Lauber, who was a human factor specialist, Dr. Lauber. Uh, works for Airbus now since he's retired from uh, the government. Uh, the failure of Continental to establish a corporate culture. Again, they knew something didn't feel right uh, in the way people acted in the, in, the, in the company, but they started to talk about it. Let's fast forward a little bit here. We blew up a refinery down in Texas cities here, so we're about a decade later here. Now we started talking, ah, an effective reporting and learning culture. We're going to see these again in a couple of slides right here. So now we're starting to narrow it down. What about this intangible? Well, this one resulted later. This, this company, by the way, who it was BP, it was a BP plant. They no longer own this refinery because recently they sold it to pay for this one. And of course, everybody remembers this one to blow up in the, in, in the Gulf here. A lot of things, a couple of many lessons here. I've read five or six books on this one, along with the, with the 300 page reports. There are three reports here President's Commission, the, uh, oh, uh, the group, and I've, I hesitate to say, the, the group that investigates uh, oh, and, and oversees uh, oh, uh, Oil, the oil and gas industry. I apologize, I don't remember the acronym there. Memory isn't my strong suit anymore. Uh, there and uh, and the Coast Guard had done uh, done one as a ship, because this is a ship in one life. It's an industrial facility in another life. They have an SMS as a ship. It's required by international maritime law. There is no SMS required for oil and oil and gas. A little bit of an ambiguity there. But the other couple of lessons here is that we think, oh, we, there was a lot of things again. You know, who did, what did, why did they do it, and we'd have done something different there. What a bunch of buffoons blew up an oil well in the in in, in the Gulf here. But I want you to remember that these people right here were on top of their game. They had just drilled the deepest well in history. They had just drilled in the deepest water in history with this rig, not this particular well, but with this rig. If anybody knew their game, it was this crew that was on board this ship come industrial facility. So we can't say it's the land of the buffoons that are making these mistakes and, and making these big mistakes, these big catastrophes. Many of your most world-class errors are some of your best people that have done it back to human error, back to, back to systems. The other thing that I want to bring out here is don't mistake, I know we talk about small signs and small signals, we're going to be looking at this in a bit, but don't necessarily mis uh, mistake surface level things such as OSHA injuries and whatnot, uh, 
oh, um, workman's comp, these sort of things, as signs of major failures. They're good things. They should be done. And many times, small failures do lead to big ones, but they have to be analyzed carefully. Many times, they are uh, unassociated. Every employee deserves the right to go home intact and, and, and alive there. But they might not also be good signs. There were executives from both companies, the company that owned the ship and the company that was operating the industrial facility here on board the night this, this one blew up. And does anybody know why they were on board? They were, they were on board to give an award the next day for seven years without a lost time injury. If anybody knows anything about this heavy type of industry, that's just phenomenal. Sometimes if you can go seven days without a lost time injury in these type of industries, you're doing a good job. So again, a lot of the little low level things, they were managing very well and they were doing a good job. They were sincere about it, but they missed a lot of signs in process safety, the things that are gonna make, make major catastrophes. They missed a lot of subtle signs on, on that. So a lot of lessons from this one. Let's talk about some levels of culture. This comes from a, a uh, if you want to uh, make you oh, uh, oh, uh, good consumers of the literature, this uh, comes from the Corporate Culture, uh, Cor Corporate Culture Survival Guide written uh, by Edgar Schein of MIT. He's written another longer book, but he's got the important uh, things in here. And I'm going to give you probably the important things from the book on one slide. So this is even below the Cliff's Notes version. But artifacts, things that we tend to look at, what's a culture? I can walk around in this building and tell a few things. You can walk around in my building. You can tell when I'm wearing this and I work for the Federal Aviation Administration. So there's some artifacts of our culture. How many of us have staff meetings? You know, it's probably gonna see a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hands there. You know, I could see probably not as many hands as there are staff meetings there. You know, you know come on, home of the free and you know, land of the brave. Uh, oh, uh, here. But we do. We have these rituals, these things that we do, right? Those are artifacts. So I could walk around here uh, in your organization probably for a few days and tell a few things on the surface about your culture. But I couldn't necessarily tell how decisions are made, how you operate. I can also see how uh, Sean and I were talking about this today, you know, the posters up there, all of our values, you know, our mission and our values and our vision and, and, and all of that. I, I warn people sometimes one man's vision is another man's hallucination. But, we, you know, they have these things up there that we want to believe, that we think we believe, and many times we do. Most times when we have espoused values, the things in our policy guidance and whatnot, we're committed to this, we're committed to that, and, and all these sort of things. They really are positive things, and many times they are things that the, the organization is trying to operationalize. But in many cases, they don't necessarily come through if we don't reinforce them. This is where c culture really lives, where the automatic, unconscious ways that people work without even thinking about it. You ask them, why did you do that? That's the way I do it here. It's the way things, the way things, the way things happen uh, around here, the unconscious drivers of behavior. We can very easily say, this is what we want to do and what we value and what we uh, oh, uh, we, 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 we like to instill, and what we may think we're really doing here, but set up in our organizations barriers to that, goal conflicts here. And one of the easiest ones, and I'm not trying to make a political statement here, wouldn't do that because since I'm on camera and my bosses may see it there, but one of the easiest ones in many organizations, how many of us think in our organizations that teamwork is a good thing? Just about every organization says teamwork is really good. Now, I stand in a major airlines, uh, Oh, uh, conference room uh, talking about this one time, people started laughing and, they, and I pointed to a sign right above me that was one of these motivational things about teamwork. So it's ubiquitous, right? How many organizations reward primarily individual accomplishment? You get your bonuses because of what you did. You get your bonuses because of individual accomplishment. You're identifiable. In many organizations, that's the way we motivate it. I'm not going to say that that's a bad thing, but you do have to be careful that the espoused values and the systems that you put in place don't subliminally conflict with each other. So it's something one has to think through. We'll talk about the reward system very briefly when we talk about high reliability organizations here in a moment there. But again, not, not to use that example, push that example too far, but there are many things. Safety is job one. We've seen this in, in our airlines. Safety, yeah, we're all about safety. It's supposed to hang it on the wall. We're given cash awards for people pushing the airplane on time. You get bonuses for on-time arrival there. That leak isn't really that bad, is it? You know. Subliminal signs, there are goal conflicts I can easily set up by the things we do that people don't think about. No employee is going to say, I don't care if that airplane crashes. I don't care if that, that, uh, you know, that, that uh, check that I'm supposed to make in, in, in whatever uh, checks and 
business that, that you have in, in your industry, let's say, you know, they, they don't internalize that. No employee comes to work to do a bad job and no employee comes to work to hurt people. But those subliminal things that, that build the real culture, and this is where we live. So that's what the safety management system is going to do for us. Of course, in culture, we have, have three areas uh, over here. This is area where we typically think those unconscious behaviors live. This is where they are exhibited in behavior. This is the one we can affect the most. We can't tell people how to think and feel. Can't really tell them how to behave. We can, but again, the culture says what happens when you're gone. Uh, oh, there, when the regulator is gone, when the bosses are gone, uh, and, and these sort of things. These are the things that we just talked about there that shape the way people behave. They're the things under most of our control. Internally in the organizations too, they have, have effects uh, as, as well there. So if we set up an employee reporting system, by the way, which we'll have in, an, in, in, a, in a safety management system, and employees put information into this, they say, oh, this is a good thing, psychological thing. Management is listening to me. And I put something in there and management pulls that out and says, hey, some employee did something wrong. Let's chase down this employee and discipline them for that. Uh, that's one sure way to kill your, your employee reporting system. Their future behavior in terms of putting anything into that is going to die. The other thing is if we put things in there and employees through, uh, over time realize they're putting stuff into a black hole. I've told management about this. I've keep saying things about this. I keep reporting this and nothing happens again. Their behavior is going to be they're solely going to give up on us. They're going to th have a different thought. So these, these, these parts uh, inter interact here. So let's talk about one more thing. We got to, hopefully we're not getting too many lists uh, for us. Again, if you, if you see things useful there, we'll, we'll provide you copies of the, of the, of the presentation here. But let's talk about something that Dr. James Reason, famous from the, the Swiss cheese, which by the way, an aside, Dr. Reason didn't use the term Swiss cheese model until his final book in, in 2008, or his, his currently final book, he's, he's still producing there. But he talked, he talked about culture a little bit, reporting culture. So we're talk, starting to talk about, okay, we talked about culture. We're trying to, to achieve, to put things in place to achieve this automatic thought pattern. What do organizations do? So let's start to get into, into that. Reporting culture. Well, we have to seek the information. We have to show people that we really want it. This is where just culture comes in. Notice I said if you put something in there and, and people report to you and, and uh, they find that they're not being treated fairly or when things happen, we talked about human error. Uh, there, one of the things I was most disappointed to, to see in, in some recent accidents where the first things are let's, let's start judicial proceedings against the operators there. I think usually only an extremist is that, is, that, uh, is that justified there. So don't shoot the messenger. Sometimes they're the best and brightest and, and had something happen to them. Flexible culture, we said we've got to be willing to change things. We've got to be willing to respond. If we're finding out things, if we're seeing things, our employees are reporting things to us, we've got to be willing to respond. If they don't see any change, they'll give up on us there. And learning, that's the other thing. In accidents, incidents, the key should be what are we going to learn from this? What are we going to do to prevent this the next time? So these are, these are hints of, of, the, of a safe culture. Now let's look at, at, at high reliability organizations. This started back in the 80s, I want to say, and it started with, have we got any Navy veterans in the room here? We probably do, yeah, have, have at least a few. This, this, this started with some operations where, where uh, Carlene Roberts and some others from uh, Cal Berkeley were starting to look at some industries or some operations. And, and we would never certify this operation. And we're taking off and landing airplanes on a, on a runway that's really too short for the airplanes there. And we're doing it at the same time. And we're doing it at a rapid pace. And we don't carry maps because the airport's not going to be in the same place where it was when we left it here. And this thing that we just said, you got to have 1,500 hours to fly an airplane. We just said, said this in the, in, in the FAA in response to some accidents. Well, our guys don't have that. But that's OK. They can't have these airline transport licenses because they're not 23 anyway. We'd have told them this is absolutely crazy. But Carlene found they're doing this every day and they're getting away with it. And of course, this is naval aviation. They're flying on off the carriers. They're doing things that we would have said are just absolutely whacked, just nuts in, in civil aviation. And they're doing it safely. Well, what is it about these organizations that makes them get away with this? Well, one of the first things is she said, preoccupation with failure. People are a little bit scared all the time. They're vigilant. They're watching out for those small signs that could, could lead to, to disaster. In a, in a world where we try to say, keep it simple, stupid, this seemed to be anathema. But what this says is don't overclassify and miss these small signs 
that, that may be, be very important to you. Don't oversimplify things. Certainly we need to make our procedures straightforward for employees to, to use there, but remember Einstein's admonition to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. His admonition, we tend to look at the first part of that and forget the last part, and that was really what he was trying to convey at the time. So don't be too quick to just classify, uh, classify things there. Sensitivity to operations, think about what's going on, have mechanisms, and this is one of the key things in a safety management system, have mechanisms that are gonna help you stay on top of the actual operation, what's going on in that mission-related uh, business, and get a big picture, uh, oh, here. Commitment to resilience, be able to recover. You know, bad things happen to good people no matter how well they're thought out. We'll talk about this a little bit more at starting the actual uh, couple minutes here. Uh, here, I'll bet you BP would have liked to have had a plan B when the well blows up that didn't expect to right here. Deference to expertise, this is where listening to your employees becomes very, very, uh, oh, uh, very, very vital right there. Notice it doesn't say deference to experts. Many times the person who's gonna know the most about the hazards on the job is probably the lowest paid employee in the company. But the person who's out there dealing with those hazards every day of their life on the job. So deference expertise, that's why employee reporting systems are very, very important. So what kind of things do they do? What are sort of things the high reliability organizations do? Organizations that is that reliably, consistently have safe outcomes that basically have cultures that underpin this automatic behavior there. Process auditing, you're gonna see these. Vigilance, we talked about that a minute ago with the other. Reward system, again, doesn't say don't reward safe behaviors, but be careful in the way we do it. Don't, be, don't, don't say we shouldn't reward per performance. People should be deserved to be rewarded. But think through the unintended consequences of what we're rewarding and what, what behaviors that might induce. Perception of risk and some kind of command and control. Okay, so can we really create a culture? I don't think we can. And I don't think we want to because, again, many times you have the strongest things. What did I talk about to our, our, our folks about just culture, about the difference between our perception of our colleagues and the accident victim there? They had most of the things needed for a just culture, all the trust and all of the, the, the good perceptions of people. The difference was I had an incorrect perception that was really inconsistent with that. It should be inconsistent with that culture of saying, I trust my, my, my fellow, I think he's competent, I think he or she is, 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 is honest, and now they're different in the, in the next day. That's really inconsistent with most of the culture. So most of the things you already have, they're, they're already strong points. So now that we're probably a ways into, into this and probably running overtime right, right here, we're gonna start talking about SMS. It's, oh good, the guy's been talking for 40 minutes now and here we're finally talking about SMS. Hopefully though we're gonna see how, remember we said we can set the environment to shape the thinking to result in the behavior. Remember that little triangle we had right here. The safety management system are the mechanics of setting up those organizational processes to help support that kind of thinking and that kind of uh, behavior here. It's something you do, not something that you have. So all of these, these things count. And I'll pass by this one very quickly. Talk about safety management strategies. Reactive, proactive, and predictive. Basically three strategies. The, the first one gets a bad rap a lot, I think. You know, how many people have heard that oh, we want to be proactive, not reactive? And it leads us in many cases to say proactive good, reactive bad. Hopefully by the end of these next two slides, you're gonna see that they're all necessary there. Also in many cases, it leads us to take a lot of things that are really reactive and classify them as proactive. And it, it, it isn't necessarily important to, to do so, but we think it's a good bad right there. Well, basically this says we're responding. If you don't like reactive, say responsive. It's a lot more proactive way to be reactive. But it's responding to things that have happened in the past. Remember that learning culture we said. The important thing about looking at bad things is to learn from it, to, to, to find out what we can add to, to our, our, our technical repertoire of knowledge. But then we don't want, we really don't want to stay there. We don't want to just wait for the accident, wait for the incident, wait for the violation. Uh, in there. So we want to look, if we're an organization, we want to see that that organization is looking at what's going on right now. Remember the high reliability organization said one that has a healthy culture is one that has a preoccupation with failure that things are going on right now. They're sensitive and looking to the operations. They audit their operations. And auditing should be looked at as a means of getting information back, not a means of passing something. So the auditor goes away. 
uh, right there. But then we want to look at things in the future. We want to look at things that we haven't done yet. Accidents haven't occurred yet. We haven't got data on this yet. We haven't got employee reports. Why? Because we haven't done it. This is in the planning and design phase. So which one's the most important? I would say none of them is more important. Because let's look at it backwards. First thing, we want to think through things that might happen. I had a professor friend of mine that, uh, that wrote a paper once that, that talked about requisite imagination that kind of engineering judgment, think through. And as a regulator, we're going to want to look through, did you look at the possible problems? Did you oversimplify the things? Did you gloss over little things that may fail? So when we're reviewing a design, this is an area up front that we want to pay quite a bit, bit of attention to. And more, more importantly, make sure that their systems are, that when we're gone as regulators, that their systems reinforce this. Now, are we going to be smart enough to see everything up front and envision or imagine everything? No, we're not, but once we go into, uh, into this, another, uh, another application of sensitivity to operations, now we're looking at what's going on today, not imagining what's going on, watching what's going on uh, today. That preoccupation with failure, that being a little bit scared all the time, watching, is that a sign of something that's breaking in the, in the system? Again, this has to be something that's both in their mechanics of their, of, of their programs, but more importantly, in, in, in the, the culture that's built to that. But then still, are we going to be smart enough to see everything here? No, we're not. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, and we do have to have a learning system. Are you watching those incidents out there? That is, if that be the question I'd be asking my, uh, my, my service provider. So all three are there. We have to make sure that resilience is built in. That is, we're, we're learning all the way down. We're designing well, but we won't catch it here. We're watching what's going on and, and remediating there. We won't catch it there and learning from from the past. They're, they're all uh, knowing what I'm going to do if things go bad, really. That reactive process, really, if it's designed in, is really part of my, my proactive and predictive strategies. And then, of course, we want to have the learning culture. OK, who owns the SMS? We have just started now talking about the accountable executive. And it's written into the, the regulation that we have going through. It's written into our international standards there. So we talk about what we call the business tier. These are the people that have uh, titles like CEO, COO, these sorts of people. This, by the way, was researched from a professor up at McGill University in, in Montreal. If you want to look at it, his name was Mintzberg. I can never remember if it was Harvey Harry or what, but just look up Mintzberg. You'll find him, uh, Mintzberg and McGill. And then we have the slave serfs and indentured servants that work on the bottom and do all the work down here. In between, we have some technical managers. So we have an engineering department. We have uh, a process engineering. We have various uh, IT departments. We have these in here. And then we have the supporting departments here. So who owns safety? Who really has the responsibility for safety? Well, I can see if it's the safety department, this is the way things go. Who really runs the operation? Remember those three we had there? If we want a safe operation, mission, safety, and money in there, if it's only the safety people and they're not the people that are responsible for accomplishing the mission and they're not the people who dole out the, the, the resources, they're not the people who can effectively manage safety and, and, and manage risk. I asked a, a large uh, emergency management uh, uh, company one time, uh, talking to them, and, and, and I asked their director of safety, I said, how much of this company's budget do you control? And he said, well, I, you know, I, I control my budget, but I don't control the operational budget. How many of the operational employees do you control? Well, I don't. I don't control the operational employees. And I said, that's right. And, and we turned to the, to the, the CEO, the COO, uh, there and, said, and, and asked them. And said, yes, we control those sorts of things. So this is where we have to see safety management from the people that have the business, uh, the, the handle on operating as a viable business, the people that run the technical <coughs> operations and down in the operating lines. Of course, your safety in larger companies, you do have safety departments that do support these, these organizations. More about that, but right now, let me, let me move by there. I think we've got, we've got that. What do we mean by accountability when we talk about an accountable executive? The idea of blame, we tend to think of accountability. It's kind of this get tough word right here. Is it scapegoating? You know, you're responsible, but who's accountable? I've heard that from the floors of Congress and some of our executives up there. Uh, uh, after, after some sort of an, an, an accident, and I think it's very highly unfair there. Now the book, again, I, I'm, I'm referring you to, to, a, to a lot of literature there for those of you that are consumers of this. Just Culture, written by a professor called Sidney Decker. Short little book. It was in uh, oh, Captain Sullenberger's briefcase and sank in the, uh, oh, uh, in the um, 
the, the, uh, the Hudson up there, trying to remember the right river there for a minute. I keep thinking of Potomac because I'm in D.C. Uh, right, right here, there. And, and the mayor, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, bought him a new copy, replaced it because he wanted to finish reading it there. I left mine out of my deck in a thunderstorm. I'm still waiting for his honor to buy me a new one. But at any rate, there he talks about backward accountability. When we say blame and scapegoating, it doesn't do any good. Something's already happened. Blaming the guy who, uh, who, uh, who we think is responsible for the catastrophe, many times just because it was on his or her watch there, and not because they were necessarily materially responsible for it, but we make them responsible and blame them anyway. Uh, oh, uh, their human sacrifice is, is not completely dead in our culture. Uh, but that's backward accountability. What we want is forward accountability. Remember we talked about being predictive, being proactive, and learning when things do happen right there. So what we're t we, we'd like to think is when we talk about accountability, we want to talk about accountability for admitting mistakes, getting the information, and taking responsibility for change there. That's what we mean by accountability. I won't take a lot of time on this. This is kind of out of our, our rule. We could talk more deeply about, about this. But when we say, what are the responsibilities of managers, we make them specific. Uh, right here in terms of hazard and, and, and risk assessments and, and, and whatnot. So uh, again, those are specific tasks. We also say, when, when, when do we do safety risk management? That's one of the major components of, 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 uh, a, um, of, of a safety management system. These are some, uh, some things when we're implementing or changing uh, systems. Uh, oh, there, remember that sensitivity to operations. We want to think through, are there hazards? Remember back to, to uh, Wilbur Wright saying, deliberately accepted risk. We understand the, the risk there. Okay, now this is going to be about the most complicated piece in the, in, the, in, the, in the brief right here. We get past this and we're over the hump. Maybe I should have done this first and things would be, be easy from there. But we'll hopefully we'll reinforce what we just talked about. Remember the guts of a safety management system. Uh, and I should have had the little ellipse slide in here, but I didn't there. We have safety risk management, safety assurance. On top of those, we have policy. And then promotion is basically your training and communication right here. The two guts of uh, the two uh, biggest one, the guts of it here, are safety risk management, safety assurance, decision making. Any decision can be boiled down into five, five, uh, five steps there. And, and let's talk about any decision making life, like buying a car. You, know, you buy a new car. First off, you need to find out what I need, need for, a, for a car. I'm an outlier. I've had five cars stolen in my life, so it's fairly easy for me to find out when I need a car. I go outside, the car's not there, it's time to buy a car. But uh, in most cases, we find out what are our needs, right? So you have a very general idea. You remember when you were in high school or college or graduate school or whatever, wherever your education uh, lay uh, there, when you were given a term paper or something, what did you do? Uh, you got your buddies from last semester, right? You know, well, no, you're supposed to go to the library and get a general idea of the subject, right? Then I get some specific information about that, some facts about that. Then I make sense of the information. Analysis need not be some esoteric, expensive, IT-heavy type of a process, but just making sense of our data. Assessment is where we actually make a decision, then we take some action. Any decision can be boiled down into, into this flow here. So let's talk about our two flow. Remember, we need to under our two processes. We need to understand in a safety in, in safety management what uh, you know what what the operation is. Understand where I'm going to put this pipeline. What's going to flow through it. What are the technical parameters in aviation? We look at what's their routes. What kind of airplanes? This sort of thing. Understanding that usually is going to lead people to what are the tough points. Remember that sensitivity we talked about. The preoccupation and looking for the small signs. What about this could crack? What, uh, in a, uh, what about this could, could give us problems there? What degree of risk is involved? What could happen? How bad is it? And, and, and how likely is it? And then make a decision. Notice that those of you that are familiar with uh, flow charting, it's a diamond, meaning it's a decision. If we decide the risk is acceptable after having thought through it, then we're good with that. Maybe something that's well controlled, well understood in the industry, nothing different here, and we're OK. But the, the process of thinking it through is important. If we decide that there is some degree of risk, then we've got to decide before we put it in a process to change that, uh, to change that design. Remember the principles we talked about, about looking at things predictively, that requisite imagination that, uh, 
sensitivity to operations. Once we put it in operation, we need to monitor it, we need to continually, uh, continually look at what's going on, that preoccupation, listen to the small signs in the BP well, the, to the well was talking to them. What they're finding was that there were a lot of things were oversimplified, they kind of glossed over some things. And these were people that were used to success. That's one of the problems. We're used to success. Most of the times in our industries, we're successful and we do oversimplify and tend to miss these small small signs. So we got to make sure we do our audits, we listen to our employees, we get some data, and that we make sense out of that data. And if we're at the end of that, we've got to, we, we find out that, you know, we've been listening to our employees, we've been doing our audits, we've been monitoring the operation, and life is good. That's fine. A no defect audit is not a bad audit. That's what puts us into what I call the happy loop right there. But the difference between the top and the bottom is the essence of assurance. I looked up and in, in I, I keep I, I'm involved in rulemaking a bit, and, and I keep a little book up on my on my on my desk there called Black's Law Dictionary. I call it Lawyer as a Second Language, and and yeah, Sean's chuckling. He's an attorney uh, over there. You know, it's actually yeah, I, I don't have to use Black so much. It's kind of Ask Sean uh, oh, uh, at, at this at, at this point there. But what I, I looked up the definition of assurance, and it just says something that gives confidence. So the difference between the top, where I've put something in operation and where I've monitored it, I audited it, I listened to my employees, I remediated any small signs that I did see in small incidents, and now I say, no, life is good, I'm working. The difference between the top and the bottom there is confidence. And that's what assurance is all about. If things were going to fail, I've got processes in place that I would have seen it. And if that doesn't, doesn't work, remember, I'm willing to do the learning culture and the flexible culture. I've got to put in place the means to change things or even possibly redesign them. So basically, SRM is a design phase, and at safety risk management and safety assurance is where I look and monitor the performance. Okay, over the hump, getting on the home stretch right, right here. Culture and risk management then, system description and analysis, that top. Sensitivity to operations, reluctance to simplify. Hazard identification, we saw some of those in the, in, the, in the corporate culture. So what we're trying to do with that, those safety management system processes is put things in place that are going to shape people's thinking about the way they manage the operations. Remember, this isn't the safety department doing this. This is the management of a, of, of a productive op, op, operation. And then, of course, we've got the, got the things here and finally doing something with that, that knowledge. Okay, safety assurance. We've got several processes in our rules, some kind of continuous monitoring, process control, day-to-day -day monitoring. We have that, I'm sure, in the industries that, that, uh, that uh, you folks regulate in here. External and internal audits. Again, those should be learning experiences and not gaming experiences out there. There should be some internal auditing that the process owner does, like balancing your checkbook. I need to know where the checks were written and what they're written for, and that I still have money to write some more of them out there. Got to listen to the employees. They're going to tell you things. When we designed that there in that predictive phase, we designed something we thought was the best design in the world. We put it in place. That in that present state is where listening to employees is most important. I'm talking about in the productive industry, but even in our, our regulars. Why? Because they're going to see things that we never thought about. Audits will audit for things you thought should be there because you designed them in there. The employees are going to say, you didn't think about this, do you? But I just encountered it. I tripped on it. I found this problem there. So that's why that, I call that the employer reporting system a gap filler, fills the gaps in our expectations. And then investigation, learning from the error. Outcomes, we're in the happy loop. Things are like we expected. They weren't like we expected, but some minor corrections are going to get back on track, or maybe we have to go back and consider the design uh, in toto. So back, safety culture there, audits and evaluation, help us learn about the, uh, about the process. Employer reporting, again, reinforcing the reporting culture, but the thing there is I want to learn something from it. I should have put learning culture in there, but I think you can fill in the dots. And then investigations, internal investigations and our investigations. Of course, we're looking for regulatory compliance as regulators, one of the things we're looking for. But why? Because we think that our regulations are risk controls and they might have been missed or they may be deficient. We may need to change our regulations here. Okay, this is the last operational slide. Or is, whew, here we aren't is just about done talking right here. Remember that, that we said that the deeply imbued uh, qualities and values, the way people think and behave automatically, is the root of a culture, a safety culture. And that's what's going to drive the way they behave and collectively, 
behavior is performance, right? And we said that we've got to set up the environment in which they work, in which that thinking is natural. Well, that's really a learning experience. So one thing I've, I've had organizations come to us is, we've got this whiz-bang safety management system, and we've got a great safety culture. And I say, that's fine. I'm sure you've done some really great things, and we appreciate your investment uh, in, in, in this. But we're going to have our guys come and give you a briefing similar to this on, on safety management system. And to a organization, they've always said, don't think we've got all of that in there. And of course, we do compliment them for what they've invested, but challenge them for, 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 or for, what, for what isn't there. But remember that a, building a safety culture isn't something that we can implement. We can't tell people we can have it. We can't require it by regulation in a practical sense. We can put the mechanics and trappings in there. We can require the sorts of things that will, will build these, these uh, processes that I just showed that will build the environment that they have. But basically, cultures are the product of organizational experiential learning. They're very slow. They're very difficult to change if it's possible at all once they're imbued. We have to change the, decide what performance is, is, is deficient, decide what it needs to, 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 to be changed in terms of the environment that we set up, and then make sure people understand it. So I'm going to give you a quick, uh, a quick rendition based on, on theory of learning here, and then, then we'll quit for the day. Uh, there. The first thing we, can, we, we have to, to have is people have basically the mechanics. I've just given you most of the mechanics of a, of a safety management system there. But this is what we call the checklist mentality. And, and that's what we were talking before the, before the briefing between inspecting and, and, and auditing. Very easy to have all the parts checked off there and not have that sense of that big, that, that, that big picture. But this is the road. If all we do is put a manual on the shelf and give people a lot of checklists and say that we've got a safety management system, we're leaving them at the road level. They at least have to understand what and why these things are going on, second degree of, of learning. And that's why it's important to communicate to employees when changes are made, not just what they need to do, but why they're doing it, why it's important, and, and, and what this is going to do for them and, and their operation. They have to be able to apply these, these, these principles to their job. The abstract principles, and I'll, I'll be full disclosure, what I gave you today is, is just the concepts, the abstract principles. It's going to have to go beyond that. They're going to have to see how it's applied to, the, to, their, uh, their, uh, oh, uh, to, to their job. It should be just part of doing the job. In fact, we shouldn't, uh, the employee shouldn't think, this is the job and this is the safety stuff or this is the risk management stuff. Uh, oh, here we we have sometimes the pre-flight checklist. There, pre-flight risk management stuff. It's one of one of our friends in Australia calls ticket and flick it. Tick off the little box here and then flick it out the window. And now we're going to go fly. We can now that risk management stuff's behind us. It's got to be something we apply to the actual technical operations, and that we have a big picture and that the pieces are correlated. We have good communication in there. That's going to not be a quick process. It's not going to be a checklist process. It's a journey. Of, of, of experiential learning where, where our organizations apply these principles. But what we're really looking for is that cultural change to where these become very, very natural. And in, a, in, in that same uh, conversation where, where I talked to our, our, our organization about who was uh, in charge of, of safety, their CEO asked, also asked me, we have four levels of SMS, and you graduate into the fourth level. And we have exit criteria for a maturation process of getting the processes in place, not this maturation process here. And he said, you've got exit criteria for up through level three, which puts us in level four. Is there exit criteria for level four? And he asked me this before coffee and before breakfast. And I, I don't know. You know. So I had coffee and I had breakfast, and I came in and made my presentation. I said, I really think, offer you this. You'll exit level four when you no longer have a need for a safety management system. When the principles that the safety management system are supposed to imbue and the way people do their operation become just the way you do it, that when that last level of, of the culture are such that all of these principles are just part and parcel of, of what you're doing in your operational day-to-day -day work, there's no more need to call something the SMS thing. Safety management will be just what you do. So this is the last slide that I have, and this is where Arndt quits talking and everybody gets happy right there. And we're back to Wilbur Wright, one of my favorite phrases right there. Uh, I often give people a test at the end of this, and this is unfair because you're not aviators, but it's, it's history. It's a history test. Who flew the airplane first? Does anybody know who flew the airplane first? Was it, was it the, the guy with the, 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 
that, that was follically challenged, or, or was it the guy with the cool mustache and still had a little bit of hair there? <laughs> yeah, most people say it was Orville, because he was the guy with, the, he was the more photogenic one, and he was the one in all the pictures there. Wilbur actually flew the airplane first, and he found out something about it that the replica builders are fly, have flying the airplanes are very unstable, and he flew it briefly, and he wrecked it. So they went back, and they, they fixed the airplane. Get, still got to get the photo ops in, right? So, and so Wilbur goes, he says, let's see, I flew it, and we don't have a whole lot of flight hours. Let's see, risk is, because he talked about risk, a deliberately accepted risk. So he's, he was the thinker there. And he says, severity, likelihood, severity, crash. Hmm. That's not good. Likelihood, flew it once, crashed it once. Likelihood's pretty high. So risk management says, that's why Orville flew it next. <laughs> Okay, any questions for me or have I convinced everybody that I'm incapable of answering them? 